welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. One of my all-time faves is back with us, Dana Skurlock, Director of Recruitment for Staffing Boutique. Hello, my friend. How are you? It's so good to be back. I know I've missed you. You've been on been away a little bit. <laughs> you know, you've been on sabbatical. You uh, and your team at Staffing Boutique lead a very busy life. And now we're going into the busier, busier, busier season. Yes. And so, wow, I'm thrilled that you're back and, and oh, here to talk you. to us. So we're going to really dig into something that even though it might still be hot at different parts around this country, holidays are right around the corner. Oi! Hard to believe. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> scary. That's the perfect description. Well, we're going to talk about like the staffing piece of this in Q4. And I think you're going to give us some really interesting perspectives on this, Dana. Um, you always give me something new to think about. And so I'm really excited to get going uh, with you on this. The other thing I'm really excited about are all of our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday. Our new episodes um, on Fridays just dedicated to fundraisers and professional fundraisers. It's a really interesting show. And then 180 Management Group. Um, I was telling Dana in the green room, we have this amazing co-host panel. They come from all over the country, super diverse in, in terms of where they work geographically, the topics that they serve and work with. It's just a, a riveting group of people. And so I hope you've been able to get to know them um, and learn from them like I have been. So a lot of fun. Dana Skurlock, Director of Recruitment for Staffing Boutique. I mentioned that you and I haven't chatted for a while. And so this is really a welcomed way for me to start my week. Awesome. It's so good to be back. It's always great just to hear about the new changes at the show and, and how many things you've added, the new formatting, the new cohort of co-hosts. It's so exciting. Well, thank you. It is. It is. I mean, you knew us when, when we were just starting out and um, we were all in lockdown because of COVID right. and you were really in lockdown because you come to us from New York City. Yes. Where there, it was really frightening. It was the brunt of winter and bless your heart. You were like in a tiny little part of this world that had no escape. And I remember talking to you and thinking, wow, I can't complain because I, I can go outside and, you know, I had a lot more options here than you did. And so I, I, I will forever remember that because um, it was really <laughs> profound. Feels like another life though, doesn't it? When we talk about the pandemic now, it's been a good solid four years. It really feels like it was in the past finally, which is a strange yeah. feeling because it felt so acute this whole time. Yeah, acute. That's a great word because you're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, it it was. And I I think for you all, the way you had to run your business and lead, um, just absolutely fascinating. Um, but anyway, I want to get on to this topic because I'm fascinated, Dana, about Q4 and the nonprofit sector. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Holy moly. Everything we're up against, right? We got to get all this stuff done. We're yeah. all stressed out workload events. Talk to us about how you view this in terms of staffing. Sure. Well, I've been in staffing specifically for the nonprofit sector for um, going on 18 years now. Oh. Um, and I know it's, it's, <laughs> and it's went by like that. So it's, it's trippy for me as it is for you to hear that. But um, <laughs> what we always talked about at all the firms that I've worked at is about the nonprofit sector cycle um, because they're on a different fiscal year and it's ending in um, June on June 30th every year, it's going to be a little bit different. And I think the Q4 for all companies tends to ramp up. Mm -hmm. um, and with nonprofits, they're kind of having a dual role where they have their own fiscal schedule that's alternate to the corporate world. But at the same time, they have to follow the same school year, nine months a year, the same corporate schedule because it affects giving. So if you're going for corporate gifts, if you're going for individual gifts within um, 
you know, people within a particular company, like as individual gifts that you're trying to collect, like if you're United Way or something like that, mm -hmm. um, people tend to ramp up their giving around the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, houses of worship, religious organizations, same thing. You have people sort of getting into a more altruistic mindset as we get closer to major holidays. Mm -hmm. And so the nonprofits are balancing both because during the summer they're having, you know, usually getting audited or at least, you know, having to reconcile their, their year finances. And then we go straight into Q4 after the summer. So mm -hmm. I always think that it is a really tricky time because people kind of come off those lazy July and August months, <laughs> having really taken a break. Most of my clients are on vacation, at least for part of the time that we're working on searches with them. And then bam, September hits, school mm -hmm. starts, corporations start talking about how it's Q4 and they need to move forward with their goalposts. And then for nonprofits, they need to sort of ramp up their operations in order to push fundraising towards the end of the year. That can mean a lot of events. Um, if you're an organization that brings in a lot of funding through events, um, it can also mean internal events, you know, as companies and nonprofits are looking at retention um, mm -hmm. for their current employees, employee relations, morale, et cetera, you might be looking at a lot of, a lot more scheduling headaches and a lot more um, just added activity, um, mm -hmm. both from external and internal events. Um, and so I, you know, I think we can lose sight of that every year that it's really in this quarter where both of those things are happening at once. You know, it's fascinating to me. I, I love the way you phrase this, the dynamic of like this rest and we're going to be rejuvenated and we're slowing down and then bam, it's just like everything all at once. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that it's a frightening environment and cycle that leads to burnout that leads to duress um of our of our teams and so um i'm kind of thinking about looking at this temp staffing in a way that maybe is a little bit more holistic and not just so task oriented mm -hmm. um and you mentioned something really really interesting is that you know while we have a lot of external events we have internal events as well. And until you mentioned that, I got to man up and say, I never really thought of it that way. To me, it just seems like gala season or walk season or, you know, symposium season, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, all of that. So talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing um, and with the clients that you, you work with. Do they understand this? I think that some do. Um, I think the more veteran development managers and directors who have kind of been around the block for a while are used to this cyclical nature. I think there's a lot of people joining into the nonprofit field. You know, the pandemic caused a lot of people to reevaluate their career goals and what they wanted their legacy to be. And so I've seen a lot of people, I always saw a lot of people wanting to switch from corporate to nonprofit, but I've seen more people make those concrete decisions post pandemic mm -hmm. um, and really start to move into that space. And I think, you know, I think people from the corporate world bring in like really important assets and, and facets to the workplace that if you are a career nonprofit um, professional, it's great to get another perspective on. Yeah. I think sometimes they can be at a deficit with sometimes understanding some of the nonprofit culture. And part of that is the way that things are structured and the event nature that uh, in spring and fall can really become overwhelming, especially for a development department, because it becomes what I hear most more than anything from hiring managers or from, um, you know, C-level executives is, you know, it's all hands on deck. So what that usually means is that they have um, a huge money making event that is coming mm -hmm. up whether it's a gala, a dinner, holiday party, whatever it is that they have for their constituents, it might be a quarter of their budget from the year. It comes from this one event. So it's worth taking the, you know, finance department, development department, and the programs department, and everybody has to pitch in uh, to get an event completed. Now, obviously that depletes the other departments having to throw resources into the event. And it can't be helped if you're, you know, in a position where you're short staffed, 
but this yeah. is a great opportunity where a consultant or a temporary employee is super useful because mm -hmm. some of those things you can offload to this person, some of the logistical event planning duties that anyone can help with that, you know, if it's all hands on deck, they can pull people from different departments. Mm -hmm. If other people that work at the organization that don't, aren't in development can help with events, so could a temporary employee that has events experience. And that's what we have at Staffing Boutique is, you know, we have a database full and a network full of nonprofit professionals that have previous experience. Mm -hmm. Many of them have experience jumping in and helping out with an event as a freelancer, um, yeah. which is its own skill set, I think. I, I think there's tons yeah. of people that are in different, um, you know, have different experiences in terms of their career. It's a specific skill to be able to go into an organization or a company as someone from the outside and do a project mm -hmm. and then leave knowing that it's only going to be for six weeks, three months, six months, whatever the duration of the assignment is. Someone that's able to come in and really um, hit the ground running, um, yeah. that's able with, you know, somewhat less instruction than you would get on a full-time job and have a week of orientation and training and all that. As a temporary employee, you're really having to jump in. And that's something that yeah. we are screening for and are able to find successfully are people that have the experience jumping in with both feet and being able to manage things without a ton of like day-to-day -day management from yeah. the person that's um, leading the department because they don't have the bandwidth for that. That's why they needed, you know, temp assistance. I only get calls when there's you know, there's a deficit within the organization in terms of like, you know, that they need assistance. So, um, and especially with temporary jobs, you know, it's not like a full-time job search where, you know, you're replacing somebody and it's a long-term fit and it takes weeks to, you know, really go through the process. I'm getting calls for temps when it's like emergency time, we really need somebody to fill in. Um, and So and let me jump in there and ask sure. you this question then, because I mean, we're sitting here, if you, you know, the dog days of summer, and it's really, I mean, at least for me, it's kind of hard to be thinking about the holidays. They, they seem really far off. But are you kind of advising us that we need to step back and say, this is right around the corner, um, start planning now? Or is this just the way the temp environment works? It's kind of crisis oriented and that's the way everyone navigates. I mean, can we pre-plan this? I would love to think that you can, and I certainly have had clients that have, that are, you know, I think it varies depending on the hiring manager and the person that's in the leadership role within the department, um, okay. because I definitely have had clients that are thinking about their, you know, cohesively about the entire year. And so maybe a few months prior, they're already inquiring us about getting help in in preparation for what they know is going to be a busy quarter or a busier quarter than what they've had in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have people that do that, but even with that much foresight, there's always going to be unforeseeable factors. Yeah. Um, and so you can plan ahead to hire a, a, you know, a freelance person, but I think the sweet spot of really doing the recruitment for that can only be once you're much closer to the start date, because booking someone months in advance, there's no guarantee that they're actually going to be available once the start date actually comes up. So I think okay. what we're always playing the dance of when we're speaking with clients is not starting the search too early and obviously not waiting until it's too late and we can't get you the resources. Yeah. So we're always kind of treading that, threading that needle. Mm -hmm. um, I would say most clients are not as proactive as that. I think most of them, uh, as the one I was describing before, I think most of them are going to call us when it's an emergency, like you said, crisis oriented um, situation. Okay. Um, I would love to see that dynamic, you know, be adjusted. But I think sometimes that's just the nature of it because part of the reason that you're needing a temporary employee is because somebody, you know, had to leave unexpectedly. Somebody gets injured. Yeah. Somebody has a medical issue. Um, maternity leave. It's just sometimes it's just based on those unforeseeable things. Yeah, I like that you put brought that up because um, absolutely life happens. I mean, we know um, AFP Association of Fundraising Professionals reports that the average development director professional doesn't uh, last more than 16, maybe as much as 19 months in a job, which is just awful for so many reasons. And we talk about that a lot on the nonprofit mm -hmm. show, but yes. yeah, let's say you're faced with that or, you know, something from maternity leave to, you know, who knows what. Um, and then your apple cart's kind of shaken up and you got to figure things out. Um, it's a very interesting process to me because 
it seems like it takes on um, an equation of flexible thinking. And I think we look around at our organizations, Dana, and we're like, okay, you, you said this brilliantly, all hands on deck versus saying, okay, let's put more, let's put new hands on the deck through this temporary staffing concept, because it seems to me like nonprofits don't even think that way, not just the financial aspect, just they're, they're used to moving folks from other departments, which is not always wise, right? Tricky. I mean, it means that the other department is expendable to some degree. And, it, you know, if it's the programmatic department or accounting, or so, I would consider those to be crucial, as would I'm sure all of the listeners. Um, but when it comes down to being able to execute an event and keep a good relationship with the donors who will be at the event, I understand also feeling protective of it and wanting to keep all of the interaction that donors have in-house, so to speak. So people that are yeah. full-time workers, and that might be the controller versus you know, someone new coming in. I think the good thing about hiring a temp is that you can do it piecemeal. You can keep all of the donor pieces where you're actually touching donors by phone, um, you know, direct contact by email, that if you know, uh, in person contact, and concentrate the temporary help on things that you that are more administrative, things that you shouldn't really, as a full time staff member, this close to an event, have to get bowed down in. You have other things that are more mission related that. I think would their time would be better spent focusing on that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, what I find like temps are able to really do is do a lot of the sort of clerical and administrative organization to assist someone then execute the event. You know, then the person is able to like send out invitations and the temporary person has been involved in, you know, every other facet. And then the actual message comes out mm -hmm. from the person that's a full-time staff member. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that there's that continuity for the donors and, and trust mm -hmm. and and you know consistency in the relationship is the bread and butter of, of being able to fundraise successfully for a mm -hmm. mission. You know, when you talk about the turnover with development professionals, I've seen that number go from two and a half years to two years, and now we're at 16 to 19 months. Mm -hmm. It can be almost impossible to even begin to bring in funding within six months to a year of you starting the job as a, you know, the development director or manager of a department, especially if they've kind of been in shambles, had a lot of turnover and you're kind of being brought in to clean it up and revitalize it. I think what can sometimes happen is organizations have someone get hired in and they're thinking they're going to be the savior. They're going to save the organization. They're going to bring in, they're going to double the, you know, projected budget for, for the year. And yeah. all of the problems are solved by hiring this one person. I think that number one, that type of pressure can certainly burn people out. But also, yeah. if you're nowhere close to what your ultimate goal is, I don't think you can expect one person to be able to, within six to 12 months, turn it around completely, mm -hmm. especially if they're not provided with the tools to succeed and they're playing catch up where you haven't had somebody in the role for the past you know, several months. And so things mm -hmm. have lapsed and they're just getting acclimated to the job. This is another reason for, you know, again, those like C-level executives to think about staffing um, and bringing on freelancers and consultants is to help with organization, or I'm sorry, departments that have new leadership that need additional assistance. You know, maybe you can't afford to have a full-time executive assistant for this person all year, but perhaps for their busy season, you could yeah. bring on a temp executive assistant, you know, to help lighten yeah. load super busy and commit to doing that every year, you know, that might help keep the development director or manager in their position for three, four, five years, rather than having the turnover happening in 16 to 18 months. Um, because I think that's part of it is that you're going into a situation where you're already at a deficit. You know, you're, if you're leaving another job, you're probably leaving a high stakes situation where you're, you know, that organization is losing their director of development. You're, you're trying to start a new job. You're trying to get acclimated to that particular um, organization. It can just be overwhelming to the point where I think people start to hop after a year and a half because the organization is not giving them the positive reinforcement that they want because the organization's expectations were outsized. Mm -hmm. based on where their department was, what they were bringing in before, and the tools that they've given the new hire. So again, that's where some temp staffing, specifically for the nonprofit sector, and then, you know, specifically for development can be super helpful is to help avoid that. 
Um, and as we head into Q4, into the event season, you know, that's something that I hear a lot of um, high level development people, you know, whether they love doing events or don't like doing events, saying that there's a lot of burnout, you know, and that they can become very yeah. overworked, particularly in these busy seasons. Well, yeah, I think the thing that's so bizarre about what we're talking about in our in our sector is that we're asking development professionals to all of a sudden put on an event coordination hat. You know, yeah. we're expecting them to become event planners. And oh yeah, by the way, you got to still keep fundraising and you got to keep, you know, managing your donor relationships and then and sell sponsorships and all this. So I mean, it's a bizarre thing that we do internally in our sector because you can have a magnificent fundraiser that could be dreadful at putting on events or vice versa, right? Somebody who's great at putting on events, but they're not really so great at managing their, you know, their donors, donor stewardship. So very interesting. And, and we don't have this discussion enough. Let's get on to this concept that you mentioned I really like the idea of the um, temporary versus full time, even looking at this, um, you know, like for a quarter, getting an assistant for that development director. Um, what does that look like to you? Is that the sort of thing that you would pre budget and you would just know that at certain times of the year for so many weeks or months, you're going to bring that talent in? I mean, I think it starts with as a conversation with executive leadership with their staff, um, especially the the people that are leading their specific department. So finding out from them when is the busy time for this organization. It could be Q4. It maybe is a different time depending on yeah. if it's an educational organization yeah. or, or you know depending on what the mission is. Um, so I think it's partly just evaluating. Um, you know, with your staff, what their needs are, and then strategizing how to get those needs met. So mm -hmm. if you're consistently hearing from your staff, Q4 is really busy, we have events happening all the time, and we don't have the bandwidth to, to completely, you know, focus on them. I'm having to pull people from other departments, it stresses me out every year. That's a perfect candidate to start looking at them and saying, you know what, why don't we get you some temporary help or a consultant or, or, you know, saying to them, what would assist you? Here's what I think hiring a mm -hmm. consultant might help you. You never know what their working style is. They may even tell you, I don't think hiring a temp would work for me. And then you can investigate why that is. Why have they not suggested it themselves before? They may have misconceptions about mm. hiring a temporary employee. And so if they're, you know, as yeah. executive leadership, if you're not sort of giving temp staffing as an option, what I'm usually finding is people sometimes are calling going, I had no idea that I could, you know, I've worked in this industry for 20 years. I'd never thought about that I could call yeah. and that I could actually get this assistance in this way. Um, mm. And so what I would encourage people to do is just to Wow. remember and consistently check in with the fact that staffing and staffing for the nonprofit sector is out there. Um, I would love if it was just staffing boutique. It is not. There's a whole industry devoted what? to staffing for I know. I know. There's so, <laughs> so many resources, especially now when I started, there were far less resources, like mm -hmm. specific firms that focused on staffing for mm -hmm. nonprofits. Now you have, honestly, uh, you're spoiled for choice now. Um, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the overall nonprofit industry. Um, so I think for for hiring managers, when you're looking at strategic planning, just remembering that staffing agencies are tools that will assist with not only just the project that you're hiring one temp for. They can help with the continuity of an entire department. They can help mm -hmm. keep you know, burnout from happening with full-time staff that cause turnover, that cause more disruption, um, which right. also ultimately takes you away from your mission. Right. Well, let's let's talk about that. We don't have a lot of time left with you. But um, first of all, I would say until I met you and, and your team at Staffing Boutique, I had no idea that this was even possible. Right. That, that there this was a specialty that we could find labor specific for nonprofits. Um, and and so it's really a mind shift. I think for a lot of organizations, mm -hmm. but I want to talk about this burnout because um, you've brought this up and, and I'm really curious to get your thoughts on how maybe this could be one of those keys to fixing 
this problem, right? I mean, that mm -hmm. I think it also could illuminate where you're short on staff. And I'm, I'm curious, do you ever see this kind of be like, wow, okay, we need a, a full-time position? Or do you see that people are like, yeah, we just needed this, this temporary fix to get us over the hump? Like, what does that look like? I think it could look like very different things for different organizations at different points in time. Okay. Um, and so I think it's also about internally within an organization, really being clear about what your needs are and okay. the best way to move forward with a, a, attending those needs. So the difference between hiring a full-time salaried position versus hiring a temporary you know, uh, consultant in is something that you would really have to assess within your own organization. And I've had organizations come and have approval for a full-time position. And then after discussing it with them, kind of finding out that it's a new role, that they've kind of created this job description and that what they're asking for may include too many disparate types of job duties. So for example, I love what you said earlier about, you know, not every event planner is like a line fundraiser able to bring in individual gifts or, you know, do um, planned giving and, 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 you know, be able to bring in an estate to the organization, those types of skills, those specialty skills. So I would say the same thing about, you know, certain job duties, like maybe the database person isn't the person that can also answer phones and, you know, write right. marketing materials. You know, I'll see job descriptions that have so many different types of job duties on them because it is that sort of all hands on deck, the nonprofit sector, you have to wear a lot of hats, like all those tropes mm -hmm. that we hear about yeah. all the time for years. I don't know that people are quote unquote buying that anymore. Like we, you know, people I think as workers are also just looking for solid infrastructure and strategic planning from, um, you know, the executives that reflect that they understand what their staff really needs. And if they don't understand it, that they're going to the staff to find out what it is that they right. need um, and making realistic expectations. So, mm -hmm. you know, creating job descriptions that make the most sense, mm -hmm. you know, things, if, if, it, uh, if a full-time job doesn't make sense, how can we piecemeal it? Is there a way that this is going to become a higher level job and that will attract the kind of person that you're looking for for the most important skills? What I often talk about with clients is what is the primary focus of the position? What is you know the thing that you really need this person to be able to do? And the other things are like nice if the person comes in knowing how to do them because those are two different things. And usually when you get down to the, the crux of what the primary need is for the organization, mm -hmm. that opens up a whole new conversation. And mm -hmm. we can really kind of consult with the client and find out what their actual needs are once we kind of present that way of thinking to them. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll find out even more information and be able to strategically plan with them. And it turns into two jobs. Sometimes it turns into a temp and a full time. You know, it, it, sometimes we can kind of change the trajectory of the of the search based mm -hmm. on us just kind of talking through those expectations and, and those those needs with the client in ways that they haven't thought of before. So what I hear you saying is really that foundational piece of a, a thoughtful job description, um, aside from a personality or a desk. I think a lot of times we're like, oh, the person that sits over there needs to do this, you know, versus mm -hmm. saying, what is the work that needs to get done and, and where are we challenged? Um, fascinating and somewhat sad that you as a staffing you know, executive would have to like help us get there, right? I, it seems to me like that's a lot of resources like us in the sector. So yeah, but it's, that's you know, a you lot can... of work. That's, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm 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 fascinated. I would not have thought you had to do this. In order to be successful in the placement, which we're not interested in placing people, and then you have churn and burn in a year, okay. and and you have to hire somebody else. We want to make long term, you know, connections between people. These are the types of details that make the difference between somebody staying for six months and it being a match where if somebody's calling us five years later saying, oh, you placed me here and I've been here for, you know, years and years and I love it. Um, and it also just comes from experience. You just you recruit long enough and you start to see how searches become successful and you're able to impart that that anecdotal information to, you know, clients who are hiring maybe twice a year versus I'm hiring all day every day, you know. Right. Right. Well, Dana Skurlock, wow, I, I always learn something from you. I think you're uh, you're in a very interesting position because you get this like overview of all the things that are going on and bubbling around 
Um, and, you know, we talk about this in the nonprofit sector. We're only as good as our relationships, mm -hmm. our staff relationships, our donor relationships, our funding relationships, our client relationships, you know, the people that we serve. So um, this is a natural extension of that mindset. But for some bizarre reason, we forget about it or we don't know about it or address how we can, you know, um, supplement our labor needs um, from time to time. And I think it's just been a fascinating thing to get to know you, um, at least for me, to get that into my brain is that this is a realistic um, approach, right? You know, it's, it's a tool that we can use. Yes. As opposed to waiting until we think we can fund a full-time job, a, a full-time position, mm -hmm. you know. Especially it's if it's an election year, funding is up in the air in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's just not a period where we can make concrete decisions. Finding mm -hmm. interim help is going to probably be the way to go, at least for the foreseeable few months. Yeah, I love it. Well, Dana Skurlock, Director of Recruitment at Staffing Boutique. You can connect with Dana at Dana at staffingboutique.org or go on over to their website, staffingboutique.org, and you can learn more about their practice, what they do, how they serve. They're also heavy into the educational um, sector. Um, so they've got a lot going on. But again, uh, the thought leadership here is what I'm so attracted to, uh, Dana, because we, we're not talking about this enough uh, throughout our sector. We're, we're really more just looking at full-time positions. And so what an amazing tool to, to put in our tool belt and to really kind of eliminate some of these stresses. Another thing I want to make sure that we do before we leave today's episode of the Nonprofit Show is to thank our amazing partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, who was one of our very, very first uh, partners, Katie, um, called me up and said, I want to be on your show. And I was like, whoa, okay. And uh, it, it started a trajectory that has been really a, a wonderful journey. So I thank you ladies very, very much. We also want to give our gratitude to Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. All right, you know the drill. I leave every episode with this mantra, and it really means a lot to me today because we've been talking about the implications of burnout and this is a big big thing we've got to be talking about so our mantra think of it in these terms about burnout and, and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well thank you my friend we'll see you back here again